G'day and welcome to Average Joe Down Under. Join your host, Darren Jonathan, as he shares his experiences on moving to start a new life in Australia, along with travel tips, paperwork advice, and all the highs and lows that come with this wonderful, life-changing experience. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Hello and welcome back to our part two with um, Jenny. Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've just decided to break this up because tax is quite heavy and there are so many questions out there and we've tried to cover a lot today. Okay. Um, and so we just thought breaking it up might make it a little bit easier for everybody. Um, again, this is not financial advice um, and please seek a tax agent, but we're just trying to give an overview of what is happening out there in this <laughs> yes, land of the world, this, wide west. Yes, lots of information. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but after we've just gone over our deductions there. Um, if we bring it back and um, we talk a bit about super, um, yeah. I've told you a bit about my story about super, which is uh, quite embarrassing, but I actually have looked into it and I feel like it's probably people should know about it. Um, so basically yeah. what happened was I moved here on a working holiday visa. My um, bank at the time not say the name, um, put me on to a super fund and um, just gave me a form to sign and said, you have to bring it back. Um, so I did that, set up my super, went away, came back, started working, went on to a different visa, obviously PR, and mm-hmm. then just give my super fund and never really thought any much of it. Yeah. Um, over the last year, then I was contacted by a lawyer who said, um, you know, you're super, you're one of the people who have been contacted because you're with this super fund and they have basically done you wrong in the past and haven't given you any advice for the last 10 years and your super has been sitting in 100% cash for nearly up to 10 years luckily I wasn't working full-time for a lot of those 10 years so I mean it's benefit now when I look back on it but still not the greatest Um, absolutely not yeah and so I just wanted to really highlight that and kind of make people aware that they should maybe check in what their super is invested in and also just checking how much is in it because um, there's a lot of fees out there from these super funds and you want to look after your retirement. Yeah. Um, and that's what it is. It's basically superannuation is our pension. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more. There, You'll actually be surprised and I'm by no means a superannuation advisor or anything like that. So I won't talk too much about this, but um. You'd be surprised if you look at your superannuation account and the transactions, all of the fees that go through there. Fees, and it's likely that you're also paying insurance as well, which I would recommend paying insurance, but is it the correct insurance for, you know, the type of investments that you're in? Um, And coming back to Darren's point, something like a 100% cash would be if you're very close to retirement age and want zero risk. But, you know, at a sort of the 30 to 40 age group you should be in quite risky portfolios because you know that's where you're going to sort of you're you're maximizing your income but then um you know you're maximizing your return on your super as well so um being in 100 percent cash would definitely not be the way to go at your yeah. age um, and also think about what insurances you do get with your super funds because a lot of them come well not a lot of them but some of them do come with certain things like life insurance income insurance, protection yeah. But you need to make sure that it actually covers exactly what you need. So you need to read all the yes. PCS, yeah. a PDS or whatever it is. Glo- yeah, PDS. <laughs> PDS. You need to read it. All the PSS. Uh, yeah, no. There's so many acronyms, but you definitely need to read it. And that's one of the things is even just read those sections that you're looking for to begin with and then figure out the rest later. Yeah. But because there's no point of doubling double paying for things that you already technically might totally, have. Totally, yeah. No, absolutely agree. And you know what I've, well, personally, I've found any super funds I've been with have been really helpful. If you just call up, explain your situation, they'll likely recommend a path for you. Um, and we, we did briefly mention super earlier, but um, I guess just kind of going down to the basics of it. So super is essentially your pension saving for retirement. Um, there's the superannuation, sorry, the superannuation guarantee charge here, which is really um, a percentage that your, a percentage of your base salary that your employer must pay into your super on 
however often you're paid. Um, so at the minute, that percentage is 10.5%. That is gradually going to increase over the next two years to 12%. So from 1 July, it'll jump up to um, 11% and then 0.5% each year up until 2025. So that is fantastic to have, like that 10.5% at the minute of your, your base salary is being paid into your retirement fund. It doesn't have to end there. I would say, you know, look into, I suppose, your own means of living and kind of what you need to survive. But if you have excess cash, it's definitely worth considering investing more into your super. So just kind of touching on on these points so that the two main ways you can do that are via non-concessional contributions and concessional contributions. Um, non-concessional contributions, these are contributions that you make into your super fund after your tax pay. So you can make up to $110,000 of extra contributions into your super fund. They will not be taxed in the super fund because your income has already been taxed. So you're not going to be double taxed. So you won't be taxed on your income and then taxed when you when you make that extra contribution into the fund. You've already paid the tax on that. The good thing to be aware of is if you earn less than forty two thousand and sixteen dollars to be exact, <laughs> um, the government will um, co-contribute. So they will contribute 50 cents for every dollar that you contribute into your super up to a maximum of $500. So good to be aware of that, that you could actually be getting some co-contribution as well if you're on a lower lower income threshold. The concessional contributions, and this will segue nicely into kind of the whole salary sacrifice piece, but concessional contributions are contributions that are made to your super fund before you pay tax. So this is what we call salary sacrifice of superannuation or salary packaging. Um, So you arrange this with your employer that, yes, the 10.5% of the superannuation guarantee charge that they are obliged to pay will be made, but you can also opt for another 5% or whatever amount that you want it to be. Um, You can arrange for that to be taken out of your pre-tax salary and paid directly into your super. The advantage of that is generally our income is taxed at a higher rate, um, whereas your super, when it when it enters into the t- um, superannuation fund, is only taxed at 15%. Your personal tax rate is likely going to be higher than that. So you're saving tax immediately with that. Um, just to note that there is a cap of $27,000, $27,500 that you can um, contribute via concessional contributions each year. And that's including the 10.5% that the employer contributes. Um, but it, that is a really good way to, you know, save yourself because it, what it's doing is by sal- salary sacrificing to your super, you're reducing your taxable income. So you're paying less tax because your income is down, but then you're also paying less tax because you're only paying the t- 15% tax in the super fund. Yeah. So just and some I, other ways to and think I of. I feel like this is such a good way, especially if you're on a long-term visa like PR. Right? Absolutely, or, yeah. Especially to save some money, but also help yeah. you for retirement especially if you yeah are planning to be here for <laughs> that's the end goal yeah, right retire early and yeah and this all it's doing is getting more expensive yes and but it but it also comes back to you need to before i guess you go into this contributing extra extra to your super you need to make sure your super fund is set up well and that you're actually making money from you yeah. know the portfolio and what investments yeah there's no point of putting into my <laughs> super fund which was 100 percent cash <laughs> it wouldn't be making any money it'd just be taxed on the way in and that's it. Yeah. Um, but yeah so just some good things to be aware of for super and this does segue nicely into i guess ways that you can reduce your taxable income so that is my favorite i know yeah <laughs> so that is a big one is the salary sacrifice yeah. into super but there's also um what's called salary packaging so that's if for example you want to buy a car you can come to an agreement now this is very um dependent on whether or not your employer wants to do this employer your employer is not obliged to do salary packaging um it's really up to them whether it's something they offer so yeah. definitely worth discussing with your employer and um some actual employers uh, send people to your um office um to actually get you to sign up so okay, and yeah. they may have hr may know about them and they may not because of covid they haven't sent them yeah. out but yeah. they maybe have an agreement um, okay, especially yeah. it happened in a bunch of my um workplaces uh, luckily, I just happened to catch someone. Someone explained it all to me. But um, after that, then I noticed that 
even like government agencies have them they just have them on their website they don't speak about them that's yeah so you can just google your employer and uh, literally type in salary sa- packaging yeah. or sacrifice and should come up with some or even just ask hr <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah they will definitely yeah. give you the answer um and it's brilliant because like a car obviously if we use that example is you know a huge outlay of money whereas if and you can sort of determine what term you want a salary package for so you could say i want to pay this off over 12 months i want to pay it off over 24 months and um, with a car you tend to go on what's called a novated lease where it includes the cost of the car and the car running costs yeah um, it was the best thing ever yeah it's brilliant because yeah. i mean you're getting it for far cheaper than if you were to buy it and outright. Not, not only you're not putting all that money up front and exactly, they usually yeah. get the car at a cheaper rate as yeah, well that's exactly it and like the fuel discounts yeah, all that oh, sort of Stuff. And you had one card to swipe for the fuel, one card to do the insurance. It was like you didn't have to keep any of the money. It was all yeah. Is all like on a like a card. It was great. <laughs> well, and yeah, and I I mean the big benefit is this is all taken. This repayment of the lease or the you know the financing is all taken out of your pre tax salary. So you're saving on paying the tax for that portion of income that if you didn't go down the path of the novated lease, you'd be paying tax on. So yeah. it's a win win. You're getting the car for less by going on that, yeah, and you're also 100%. paying less tax. And not only that is you can change your car as often as yes. the lease term. So if you decide you want it up, your you know change your range, you can yeah. over. You can go wherever. We can go to a Tesla, whatever. Like. Obviously, you pay more money for those things, but you can get the car that you actually want. Yeah. In some cases, you wouldn't be able to afford to buy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, But but we've talked about cars, but I mean, you can pretty much salary sacrifice anything. You can salary sacrifice like a laptop, an office chair, you know, anything. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Rent, childcare fees, um, insurance, mortgage. Like some people do that. So you... (laughs) It's definitely worth looking into because you're saving on, you know, paying tax on that taxable income by salary packaging it. So if it's something you think is of interest, inquire with your employer. As I said, not all companies do or are obliged to offer it. Um, The other thing just on reducing taxable income, we've obviously spoken a lot about deductions. So really just maximizing your deductions. Um, You know, we spoke a bit of time talking on the last episode with working from home and car running expenses. But um, it's just, I would say the biggest tip, and if you haven't done it yet and it's coming up to end of tax year, don't worry, there's always next year, just keeping a record. Like that is the main thing because there is no way that you will remember in July of August <laughs> last year what you bought that related 100%. to work. So really keeping, and it can just be a very simple, I do love Excel, I've talked about it twice now, um, a simple Excel spreadsheet. But I also say things like, um, you know, people who are not working, it's easy for me, I'm working on a laptop all day, every day, but say, I don't know, like nurses or people who work in the beauty industry, they're not sitting at a laptop. So I would say creating a folder in your phone where, you know, you buy some, you buy a product for say your beauty salon or, you know, that you use for work. Like if you're a nurse, you've bought a packet of gloves, say, like just taking a photo of the receipt, saving that into this folder you've yeah. created for like work deductions. The ATO also have actually a really good um They've got the ATO app, but within that app, it's called um, My Deductions. And it's just a simple app where you literally upload screenshots, you know, wow. keep track of all of yeah. your expenses. And then it's easily filtered into your tax return. My easy one is what I do is I just have a folder in my email. So if I get any yes. emails, I just ask for an email receipt or a phone receipt and, yeah. you know, just shove it into like a safe folder. Yeah, that's exactly. It just it saves so much time then come tax time at the end of the year. Um, so the other one then, which is a sounds complicated, but it's really not, is negative gearing. And I'm sure, I don't know, maybe not. I was going to say, if you're on TikTok, you've yeah, heard no. about it. It's only because I follow all these yeah. people. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> get your negative feed. gearing, get your negative gearing. Um, so in very simple terms is if you own an investment property and the cost of owning and running that investment property exceeds the income you're making from it, that's essentially negative gearing. And what you can do is um, use that loss that you're making against your taxable income that you make from work 
purposes and um, so really that's what negative gearing is so it's um offsetting that loss position that you're in on your investment property against your taxable income to reduce it um not saying that that is a reason to go out no. and buy an investment property to try and make a loss good on financial it, but... decisions, <laughs> yes, good financial exactly. decisions. Um, but it is a, a way if you're making it if you have an investment property and it's not doing as well as you expect just remember that you can um you know that negative yeah and i guess first people's your... reactions are to the market right now is oh my gosh i gotta sell and a lot of people are actually selling and then people are buying like it just yeah. seems like never ending yeah. but you can use the tax at the I know if you can hold in and you can have a good financial position yeah. for the rest of the year then you might as well use this on your tax return absolutely yes and yeah. then use that to if you get a refund then great yeah well and I mean you could do a whole separate topic or a whole yeah, separate episode huge. on investment properties and deductions you can get there like whether it's repairs and maintenance or capital so you know that's a whole other topic yeah. but um, I would say you know again coming back to the point of if you're unsure it is worth getting a tax agent for things like that if you feel that some of your income sources are you know a little bit more complicated it's yeah. worth getting some professional advice on some of the things again professional devi- advice. advice yes <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about like working holiday visas and went to residents and things like that. But what about someone for a business? Because we've had a few people on the podcast who have their own side business or hopefully going to get to the point where they're going to be making money from their yeah. business or their side business at least. Um what kind of way does that look like a business tax? Um, so, yeah, I mean, business, again, is like a whole separate world, really, from a tax perspective. But I'm just going to assume for the purposes of the podcast that um, these businesses are run under like a sole trader structure, because if you go down a company structure, I mean, that's a whole other ballgame. Yeah. yeah, I think um, we just go down that. Yeah, so <laughs> assuming if these are like side businesses and things like that, then... Um, it's really going to be set up as likely a sole trader structure. Um, There are four sort of main structures for a business. There's sole trader, partnership, company and trusts. Um, But for most people just starting out, it generally will be structured as a sole trader. The beauty of that is um, you do register for what's called an ABN, an Australian business number, but you can essentially operate this business under your own name. just a side note, if you do want to operate your sole trader business under a different name and that's, you know, that's the name that you advertise and put out there, you should register your business name with the Australian the, Business yeah. Register. Um, but that's a separate topic. Yeah. But <laughs> for, um, so for small businesses, I guess a couple of things to be aware of. There's generally each year some sort of tax incentive and particularly when we were going through COVID, there was a lot of initiatives to try and keep small businesses afloat because obviously, you know, with the the tough times, everyone was struggling. So just being aware of some of the, you know, benefits and incentives that are available for small businesses is good. The big one, which um, I talked about on my page recently is called temporary full expensing. Um, It's probably a bit late in the day to be mentioning this because it expires or ends on the 30th of June 2023. That was a COVID initiative which um, was extended out. So that will end this tax year. But if you're listening and you're thinking of buying yourself an asset for your business, be it you know, a laptop or some piece of equipment that you will use for for your business and that will help produce income, then um, I would do it now because temporary full expensing means you can fully deduct the cost of that asset in your tax return this year. And sorry, just to take a side note, but the businesses have to have a registered ABN. Yes. Correct. So it has yeah. to be an actual business. It can't just be a side. Otherwise, that's personal tax. Correct. Right? And the yeah. temporary full expensing is for businesses only. Yeah. It's not a personal just thing. Clar- yeah. Sorry, Clara. So you can't just there. go and buy a car. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I've got a car for my business. <laughs> yeah, no, you do have to have an yeah. ABN. Um, but th- but once from so once one July kicks in, um, what will come back into place is called the instant asset write off, and that's an incentive that was in place before the temporary full expensing was kind of extended out to sole traders and small businesses. Um, so the instant asset write off is still pretty good. So it will allow you to fully deduct the cost of an asset less than twenty thousand um, dollars, which is a lot for a small business. That's quite a quite a large threshold. Um, anything over twenty thousand again we'll come back to that depreciation method so it will go into for small businesses uh um what's called a simplified depreciation pool and they're deducted over a number of years um 
and it's for small businesses you actually get more favorable depreciation rates than say larger corporations um so that's kind of something to keep in mind as well is um your your asset pool you can actually depreciate when I say depreciate, sorry, deduct for tax purposes, um, thirty percent of your asset pool each year. So that's something as well. Oh, it's okay. kind of an extra oh, yeah. benefit for small businesses. One hundred percent. Um, the other one for small businesses is for prepaid expenses. So, if you prepay an expense that is um for a period for a service that is for tw- say twelve months, like say you were running a business and you had business insurance and it was up for renewal the 1st of June. If you were to renew at the 1st of June, you can actually deduct the full cost of that in your 30th of June tax return, even though some of the service relates to the next tax year. Okay. But because you've prepaid and it's for a 12 month duration, you can de- fully deduct it this year. Um, again, that's something that's only out there for small businesses. Coming back to superannuation, if you um, make any personal super contributions for yourself, which is something, another kind of side note, a lot of sole traders, people running their own business, totally forget about superannuation and don't really yeah. want to put their money into something they can't access until, you know, they're 60 or whatever. Um, but I would say it's really important at the end of the day, you know, you're setting up a business to... Sort out your super. Obviously helped people and that, but you, yeah, retirement is the end goal. Yeah. So um, just not forgetting about contributing to your super. If you were employed, you would be getting 10.5% of your base salary into your super. So, you know, just Hopefully, think about yeah. that as a sole Do trader. That as a and the contributions are deduct- tax deductible. Um, there's also another, sorry, the last one. There's also another one called the small business tax offset, um, which can reduce the tax you pay up to a thousand dollars. Now there's thresholds and all of that in place. Um, but just something, if you again have a tax agent doing it, they will absolutely know to apply this offset. Um, but just, you know, there are things that if you're sort of doing all of this yourself, you're in, you're trying to run your business. These are sort of the things that, you know, are not what you're going to focus on. So just being aware of some of the incentives yeah, that are out there for 100%. small businesses can save you a lot of money. And that's it. That's what we're trying to do here is uh, give you tips and tricks to yeah save money, but also understand the tax, especially yes. if you're maybe listening and you really are wanting to start a business or you're thinking or you're maybe a plumber from overseas and you haven't really set up your business here yet. And yeah. these are the types of things you maybe need to know. Yeah. And other things like, you know, just... I would say from day one, and I know like finances and admin are more on, you know, the back burner for people. And it's really only when it comes to tax time, everyone's like, oh, no, I need to scramble. I would say get yourself, if you're starting up a new business, get yourself a software like Xero. And I feel like most people have probably heard of Xero. It's, you know, it's an off the shelf, very basic package, really reasonably priced. I think they do like a, a seven or 15 day free trial for you to test it out. But just even get the basic of basic packages with them. It's just a great tool to sort of keep you on track, keep records there um, so that you don't come 12 months later and have to, you know, try and trawl through yeah. like receipts and whatnot. And I've heard some good things about them as well. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I just said there that finance sort of does go on the back burner a bit for businesses, but it's so important. Like if you think of, you know, all of the large corporations have a CFO, a chief financial officer, because, you know, who's part of the executive team, because, you know, finance should be at the forefront of your mind, particularly now in, you know, where we're going yeah. with the economy. Like cash is king, really. You know, you need to know where, you're where your cash going. is at, where it's exactly that, where it's going, like looking at just sort of a week's time of this is what I'm going to buy. This is where I'm going to get money from. You really need to be forecasting and looking ahead for like the next sort of 12 months, because unfortunately we see so many small businesses start out, but then they just kind of can't sustain and they're not, they're not forward looking enough to kind of look at these things that none of us can really predict happening with like interest rate rises you know the the increase of product prices and all of that now so businesses businesses are struggling because they haven't really thought to look ahead and um, sort of factor in some of these 
uncertainties, really. And if you're a sole trader, you're the basic or self-employed. You're basically that's your business. Yeah. You are the CFO. You're yeah. the CEO. You're the uh, your HR. You're that's everything. Exactly it. So. Yeah. And that's where you just I would say again, you know, get help. If if finance isn't your forte or something you're not that interested in, get yourself a good accountant. A good accountant should be able to tell you, you know how your what your profit is how your business is performing what your cash flow looks like um so just yeah i would say don't put it on the back burner like just 100%. get it sorted sooner rather than later yeah um is there anything else you want to mention before we go on to the tips and tricks um not really there was a little i was going to just touch on capital gains tax as well yeah. if that's okay <laughs> no just, go ahead because um, i mean this is advice for everybody like this yeah, is yeah like, i feel like we're jumping around a bit but it all no, does it's the, yeah i think we're, yeah we're, we're gonna um, go guess go come on but the, yeah, I know, give me more, I know, give me more. <laughs> um so capital gains tax essentially to break it down is if you sell an asset like a house, for example, if you sell it for more than what you bought it for. So say, for example, you bought a house for $500,000, you sell it for $200,000, sorry, you sell it for $700,000, you've made a profit of $200,000. That gain that you've made is taxable. Just one thing I did want to highlight is if you own an asset for over 12 months, that gain will be discounted by 50%. It's called the CGT discount. Um, so that would mean that in that example, only $100,000 is taxable if you've held that property for over 12 months. So it's something that's worth noting. If, if for example, you're buying shares, you know, and you've made a gain on them, just have that in the back of your mind. If you didn't yeah. own them for 12 months or more, you'll be paying capital gains tax on the full whack, as yeah. opposed to if you held them for 12 months or over, you will reduce that gain by 50% and be taxed on that. 100%. Um, and here, which is different to Ireland, I'm not sure about the UK, but um, capital gains are taxed at your personal tax rates. There's no separate percentage for capital gains tax they're just lumped into mm. your your taxable income and okay. tax to your personal tax rates um so yeah but again that could be a whole separate no, topic no yeah, on yeah. Capital gains again tax. these are quite over like we're going through big topics quite yes like skimly general yes yeah <laughs> we're just skimming through them because again like obviously tax advice is at your own peril and very <laughs> and, you know like very specific to your own individual circumstances yeah, and everything's really. different right yeah yeah um so is there anything you want to highlight just before we go to the Q&A? Um, no. I know you just want kept record keeping seems to be like a big one. That was the big one for tips and tricks. It was really around record keeping, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, you know, things like the ATO online access. If you're here for a longer time and, you know, you think you're going to be doing more than one tax return, you know, in your time here, I would say register for it. Otherwise, I would consider, as I said, using a registered tax agent um, because I don't think we actually mentioned timelines here. But if you're doing your own individual tax return, it is due on the 31st of October each year. If you have a registered tax agent that you're using, you will actually get an extended deadline um, to complete the tax return. So that's another benefit of having a tax agent. The cost of it is tax deductible and you get an extended deadline for, yeah, awesome. for submitting a return. Okay, so thank you very much, Jenny. That thank has you. been. I've learned stuff today, <laughs> God. and which is good. And because uh, I always like to keep learning, because at the end of the day, we're if we're here and we're doing tax, we can, yeah, we can maybe. Oh, it. and look, I'm still learning too. So yeah, we can deduct some more. <laughs> All right, let's go into our Q and A, and I'll just get up the the yes. um the questions because obviously Hit so me with them. <laughs> i know so if you haven't already, um, go and follow Air Consulting on Instagram, and I'll post how it looks because there's a underscore in between <laughs> there name. is the other um, one was gone yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry um and then obviously um, i'm at average joe down under um but we put up some question boxes uh, yes. the other day because we really wanted to have a bit of q a because again we try to cover everything but you know yeah it's obviously not the case sometimes so and i would just say as well please reach out to me directly like more than happy for you to dm me or i've got my email address on my instagram page if you know if anything we've covered today you need more info on please reach yeah. out directly to myself happy and to yeah and once this is posted go back on and once it's all live and we've promoted it and stuff we will probably do another q a yeah. so we can get yeah, a bit more and then idea, you can yeah. do a lot of content through that because Perfect. it's time to get some of your stuff out because you've got some good content on your <laughs> instagram um okay let's start with 
this one um, that was came in said, my boyfriend's company wants him to continue to re- work remote when in Oz. What are the tax impl- implications? Hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So, I mean, without really knowing the specifics of the situation, I'm going to assume that he intends on living over here in Australia you know, and would be a resident for tax purposes. If that is the case, and sorry, that his job haven't relocated him out here. I'm assuming he's moved out here of his own accord and has kept this job, but intends to live out here. Therefore, he's a resident. Um, If it's different, please feel free to message me. Um, In that case, he actually, if you remember what I spoke about, I think it was on the last episode, um, he would actually be taxable on his worldwide income. So the risk is that he'll be taxed in Ireland on that income because the company is Irish based and that's where he's earning the, in- well, as in that's where yeah, he's earning the income, the source of income is there because yeah. the company is Irish. But because he's a resident here, he also will be taxed on that income because it's world, it's foreign income. Yeah. Um, but, but again, it does he depend on get, resident status, right? It totally depends on resident status. So if he's not a resident, yeah. then um, Maybe different. that's a different yeah. story. But um, if, if that is the case where he's taxed in both countries, he will receive the foreign income tax offset. Um, so... He will, which will actually be on the Irish side, he'll get that um, for the tax he's paid here in Australia. So it's like the reverse of what yeah. we were talking about earlier. Um, but I guess one other thing that kind of struck me of this is, which is probably more a, a consideration for the employer, if, if um, her boyfriend is here in Australia, the company would actually need to consider whether he's located here in Australia and they should be complying with Australian employment rules like should there be workers compensation which is essentially insurance for your employees and you know should they be paying him superannuation because he's actually doing the work here so there's a lot of factors to consider with that question it's a Um, a big loaded question especially when you work remote from another country yeah um, and so it all I mean yeah there's just a lot of specifics to it but as I said feel free to reach out if that sort of doesn't answer the question but I think what will likely be he'll be taxed in both countries assuming he's a resident for tax purposes but we'll get an offset because of the double taxation agreement so we'll only technically pay yeah. tax okay that makes sense all right um our next one is what the tax rate for subbing i assume they're meaning subbing is in teaching yes so i assume that's, so yeah. yeah i mean tax based. rates are not industry based so it's not no. like there's a different tax rate for subbing versus you know being an electrician um it's really again comes back to which i feel like i mean it was one of the general topics i covered but whether you're a resident or non-resident is really what it boils down to and what tax rates will apply um the other thing is and you can tell me darren whether this would be the case if you're subbing could you potentially be a contractor um if you're subbing you are I don't know if you would call it a contractor, but because you, you're still income, you're, it's still, you know, you can do as many days as... Well. I think it comes down to how much you earn in that year. But would um, you be through an agency or like is the well, school directly Well, it does paying? through an agency, yeah. yeah. So, you, well, you can be, but you can also go through a school. So it's very different. Okay, yeah. Because I was going to just say, if um, if you're like a contractor and you have your own ABN and you're like contracted oh, right. to that right, no, school. no, that's not the case. Okay, no, okay. You don't have your ABN. So you actually just are a normal person income tax yeah and um though i noticed that some people's questions with this actually uh, for, for subbing on the thing was maybe potentially that they were on the wrong tax code and people were asking is that why because uh, i'm subbing my tax my taxes more it shouldn't be it shouldn't be. Yeah. It should be all the same normal it regular would be tax. potentially if you're a working holiday it could be the fact that they're not registered or yeah. you know so or they could be looking at you as a resident or a non-resident whereas you're actually the other way so it really depends on your residency and visa status what visa you're on okay, yeah, yeah. So, so it does okay yeah so, so again i would say yeah. if that person wants to reach out to me yeah i would say that for me especially when i came on a working holiday visa and then after getting PR um, it was all done by normal regular t- income tax yeah so whatever oh, you earn yeah, at the end then you gotta, be, yeah. so if you do get 
that emergency tax code you just sort it out by ticking the residency box hopefully yes yeah yeah, yeah. and there's obviously that's exactly it's either uh, some reason or you haven't given your tax file number or something um, and yeah. if the tax rate doesn't look right yeah if it doesn't look right please seek your your employer yeah they should absolutely your HR department should be yeah. able to help um, okay so working as a freelancer doing temp contracts in Australia all tax advice is very much appreciated Okay. So if you're working as a freelancer doing temp contracts. So that's probably someone I would imagine who has their own ABN, um, which is tricky because in that situation you get paid and tax is not withheld by the employer. So if you're being employed as a contractor, which it sounds like that person is, you don't you don't really as a contractor the employer is not obliged to pay you super they don't have to withhold your tax so you're essentially working for yourself really so you're responsible Um, for those two things yes so a bit like i was saying for the sole trader because it's like it is like a sole trader really um you just need to be mindful that you're keeping aside uh, rough kind of baseline i always say keep aside 30 percent of the income you earn in a separate account to for tax purposes. Hopefully you'd pay less than that, but you know, like just good to keep it aside. So that's probably one of the tips I would say is always have that sort of separate stash kept aside for tax, but also um, superannuation. Like keep in mind that you should out of what you receive for contract work, if you want to, you know, if you plan on staying here, I would look at contributing a certain portion of that to your yeah. To your so super. you basically have to, if you're an ABN, you're responsible for those two things for your tax and your yeah, because they yeah. don't have to pay it the contracts exactly. Yeah, they're yeah. not they're not employees because you're not technically an employee or yeah. a contractor. But hopefully, some of the content we did talk about, um, you Answer know, in this episode that around deductions and things like that help as well. Yeah, and I really think that um, you know it depends on individual, right? It's either personal because because in those contracts it could be like. Um, you're an employee. Well, and that's so it. It's yeah, it's totally different because it's such a it's such a grey area. The whole are they an employer? Are they a contractor? Yeah. If you, I know there's a lot of terminology. If you're sort of working independently, you know, and not really getting any of the benefits or direction even from this employer, you're considered a contractor. If you are, you're an employee, and then yeah. it's a whole. You know, they should be paying you super and all. 100%. So, so maybe that's another thing to look at. Do you mm. feel like you're an employee? If you are, then they should actually be withholding tax and paying you super. Yeah. So, so again, it's talking to the contract, the, yeah. whatever you're working for, for the contract as well. Yeah. Um. But again, some freelancers, I suppose, work online. And that might yeah. Be a thing. Um. Okay. Working from home deductions. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So, uh, the COVID visa. Do we pay more tax on the COVID visa? Yeah, so interesting. And obviously, that's quite new now, the COVID visa. Um, essentially, the COVID, like if you've moved on to a COVID visa, it doesn't actually change your residency status. I'm sorry, do you, the question of do you pay more or less tax comes again back to your resident or non-resident or working holiday visa. So if you went from a working holiday visa onto a COVID visa, which I think is the 408 visa, um, you will still consider to be on a working holiday visa. So essentially what, ever visa you moved from to go on to the COVID visa, your residency status really still stays the same. same. So if you're a working holiday visa, you would still be considered a working holiday visa. If you were a foreign resident for tax purposes before moving to the COVID visa, you would still be a foreign resident. So it's not that you pay more tax being on a COVID visa. Other than a working holiday visa, the visas you're on don't really determine your tax rates. It's really comes back to that whole, are you a resident or are you not a resident? Um, okay. So yeah, so in yeah. in short, no, you don't pay more being on a COVID 408 visa. Um, it really comes back to what visa or what was your residency status before you moved yeah. on to that. And also if you're paying more tax than you should be, you should ask your employer why. Um, well, yeah. And seek, help, seek advice from yeah, the Yeah, and hopefully even with, some of what we've talked about, like people might be able to sort of look at what tax they've paid year to date, work at, you know, and it's just a matter of dividing the tax you've paid over your income. That will give you a very rough percentage of what yeah. you're paying. Um, you know, and if something looks alarming, if you're like up in the high 30s or 40s, but your income is quite yeah. low, then something or doesn't look right. Or if your income is half, you're like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, just, um, yeah. Um, okay. So I think our next question is answered from, um, it was a DM um, to myself was any help with tax and deductions I think well, we've I hope co- we have. <laughs> we've covered that I think in full um, now our tricky one 
Um, if you have a letter to pay Irish PRSI while over here or there, it's very it's hard to make that one out. But what happens if I quit the company and ha- that I have a letter with? Yeah, so I was I was a bit unsure about the the full meaning of this um this question, but one thing I will say, which hopefully will help, um, so PRSI for those who don't know is pay related social insurance, um, it's a a tax that you pay over in Ireland, um, but your employer is actually responsible for making the correct PRSI contribution or withholding the correct contribution from your pay. Um, So it's really them that are actually held responsible for um, that PRSI contribution and any amounts that might be due. So if you as a taxpayer have received a letter about not having paid enough, if that's what it is, um, then it's really that should be going back to your employer because it's their responsibility to make sure that that contribution is correct. Um, Yeah, so I'm not... That's, I guess, as much as I can give to that, but um, it's a hard without knowing the full circumstances. Yeah, but it's it really sits with the employer that that responsibility. Yeah. So if you are maybe seek advice from your employer or speak to them about what's going on, or I can put you in touch with an Irish tax agent if you like. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I actually had one question come through, which was, um, "Am I a permanent resident for tax purposes if I'm on a working holiday visa or sponsored visa?" So first one is easy: working holiday visa, which is the 417 or the 462 you are not considered a resident for tax purposes whenever you're on a working holiday visa you're not you're deemed to be a non-resident um most employer sponsored visas would be considered temporary residents so not permanent residents like wouldn't get that tax-free threshold but Again, it does come back to those tests, like those residency tests, because you could be if you're on a temporary skilled visa, but, you know, you've bought a property here or you've bought a car here and you look like your your intention is to stay here, then yeah. you would be then deemed would a resident. Be, yeah. yeah, but I guess the easy one to answer is working holiday visas will never be considered a permanent resident. They've got their own sort of tax yeah. rates and tax brackets. But the um, temporary skilled visas, it really does come back to that whole residency test. Yeah. And again, if you don't know, ATO website. Yes, they yeah. do. It's <laughs> easy test yeah. to help you determine it. Yeah. Was there any other questions came through? The other one we had was um, just around side hustles. Oh, yes. Whether yeah. or not. That was right. Um, online income. Yes. What happens, the tax rate, because a lot of people now are making oh, money online. Oh, everyone's doing it, I feel. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's got a little bit of a side hustle, which is great. 100%. And, you know, with the cost of living and, you know, salaries not necessarily reflecting it, yeah. it's uh, we need something. Um, so what happens there? It's actually, it is a bit of a hot topic. And obviously the ATO have clued on that a lot of people are running side businesses or side hustles, as we call them. Um, so... I guess there's three things. Well, the question is, should you be declaring this as income? And it comes down to these three factors. Is your aim with this side hustle to make a profit? If so, then that would indicate that it's a business and therefore the tax or sorry, the income should be declared. Um, Looking at the repetitiveness of what you're doing. So if, for example, you're selling clothes on Facebook Marketplace as a one-off because you're clearing out your house, definitely not income you would need to declare if you are um upcycling clothes and you know repairing them and adding like lace and beads and making them all nice and you're selling this regularly and you're doing this you know upcycling on a regular basis then yes that could be deemed a business because you're not just doing a one-off sale um then if you've got a social media presence and you're kind of advertising your services and your business on Instagram, TikTok, all of that, then again, that would indicate it's a business. So I guess with the ATO, it's, it's a very gray area and there's no like real defined sort of criteria, yeah, but they're that. the kind of things that would indicate that this is a business you're running and therefore it's income that should be declared. And um, the other thing which is interesting, and I meant to actually do a video on this recently, and I don't know if people are necessarily aware of it, but, you know, influencers and bloggers now, we've all seen them who are like spot or um, advertising like, you know, gym gear, protein powders, yeah, beauty sure. products. Technically, if as an influencer or blogger or vlogger, um, you should actually be declaring those products that you receive for free to advertise 
um, as income. So the value of those products, because you've received them as a gift, you're getting paid to advertise these products. Yeah. You should actually be declaring them as income on your tax yeah. returns. So you can give me a product, so <laughs> it means there's more stuff for me. Exactly. Yeah. Send me stuff. <laughs> Not that um, that'll ever happen, but still. <laughs> you never know. Dream big. Yeah. <laughs> well, you think the that comes down to is everybody has a problem with taxable. Um, everybody has a problem with tax, but the problem is you're getting ta- if you're getting more tax you're usually making more money yes, right exactly, so yes i mean <laughs> yeah everybody has a problem um but yeah i think that rounds up our q a doesn't yes, it yeah that was it for me. um well i really thank you for coming on the podcast thank and, you for having me yeah. i hope i didn't bore you too much no <laughs> we have got so much value from this and Good. i think people are going to go away and really um hopefully apply this to their lives yes. um and if you, if in doubt, seek advice. Yes, absolutely. Um, because this is not financial advice. This is just us yep. having a chat about all things tax. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and as we said, everyone's situation is different. So yes, I would absolutely seek advice. Yeah. Um, so please go and follow Jenny on at Air Consulting. And yes. there's a underscore, underscore in between. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, also I'll post this with making sure that you are able to find her Instagram. Um, she's got uh, also a TikTok and a lot of her videos are posted there as well. Yeah. Um, and please just go and interact with the content because a lot of the things that if you do have extra questions are usually in those videos. Um, yeah. Especially when I watched one or two of them, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so, <laughs> sense. so much sense. Oh, I'm bad. Um, yeah, so she really makes tax simple. Um, you know, And if you have got anything a bit complicated from these two episodes you know dm yeah. jenny and she will absolutely help you out. yeah more than happy to help yeah and oh, maybe and we you do another right. q a sometime or something yeah if we get a lot of questions and in. um point you in the right direction of where yes. to go next um well thank you jenny for thank coming you, on Darren. we Pleasure. appreciate it um <laughs> we'll see you soon yes Thanks for listening, guys. This has been Average Joe Down Under. If you like what you heard, then be sure to hit like and subscribe. Have a question for Darren or a topic you'd love him to discuss on the show? Get in touch at Average Joe Down Under on Instagram or check out www.darrenjonathan.com. See you next time. And remember, you're only ever one decision away from a totally different life.